Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, how to front run the opportunity. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. Guys, exciting episode for you. This is the sequel. This is part two of What's Next with Vitalik Buterin. We ask, what's next for Ethereum? In today's part two episode, we talk more broadly. What's next for the world? What's next for AI and the intersection of crypto? This is the social and philosophical side of Ethereum. We get into the question of what have we created here? What is Ethereum holistically? Is it like a country, a network state, as Balaji might say, or is it a DAO? If it's a DAO, how should DAOs be governed? Should we use a corporate governance structure? Or should, should we take the learnings from philosophy and political science and apply those things to DAOs? And then we end with the biggest question of all. I have never heard Vitalik comment on artificial intelligence and his thoughts, but he gives us those thoughts today. Is AI coming to destroy humanity? We ask him that question. Will there be a peaceful coexistence? And what is the intersection between crypto and artificial intelligence? Crypto, of course, being a decentralized technology, AI being one that centralizes. Are we in for the cage match of the decade, of the next century? Maybe that's ahead. Vitalik as well thinks AI could be coming sooner than he previously thought. I think this is after a trip to Silicon Valley and talking to some experts. So a lot of content to unpack. Of course, this is a second part of a two-part conversation with Vitalik. If you want last week's part one, go back on the RSS feed and you can download that. You should see that. Guys, of course, we're just going to get right to the conversation with Vitalik Buterin. But first, a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. If you've been listening to Bankless, you know that we're fans of the modular blockchain thesis. The idea that blockchains will separate execution from data availability and consensus, allowing all three to become the best versions of themselves. And Fuel has built the fastest modular execution layer in the industry. By supporting parallel transaction execution, Fuel unlocks significantly faster throughput for the Web3 world. Fuel also goes beyond the limitations of the EVM with its own Fuel VM, which is more efficient and optimized, opening up the design space for developers. And lastly, Fuel brings a powerful developer experience with its own domain-specific language, Sway, and a supportive tool chain called Fork. With Fuel, you can have the benefits of smart contract languages like Solidity while adopting the improvements made by the Rust tooling ecosystem, letting the Fuel development environment go beyond the limitations of the EVM. If you want to learn more, there's a link in the show notes to see how you can get involved with the Fuel network. In all of my years in crypto, I have never been hacked, scammed, or lost money to a thief. And a lot of that credit goes to my Ledger hardware wallet. The Ledger Nano X and the Ledger Nano S Plus hardware wallets allow users like you and me to secure and manage all of our crypto assets and our NFTs, all with the security of storing users' private keys offline and out of reach from hackers. The Ledger Nano X is the perfect hardware wallet for managing your crypto and NFTs on the go because it connects to your phone with Bluetooth and has a nice big screen for easy transaction readings. Ledger has also upgraded the iconic Ledger Nano S and made the new Ledger Nano S device more DeFi and NFT friendly, making it the perfect hardware wallet for beginners. Ledger has truly maximized for both ease of use and security. So discover which Ledger device is best suited for your journey by going and visiting shop.ledger.com. Nexo is your financial hub for all your crypto needs. Nexo lets you buy crypto instantly with your credit or debit card or via bank transfer. They also have an awesome advanced trading platform called Nexo Pro that pays you rewards when you swap crypto assets. And Nexo also lets you earn interest on your crypto in Bitcoin, ETH, or other assets. And they also give you an instant crypto line of credit with as low as 0% APR. And they also give you access to a crypto-backed MasterCard of course, earning you more crypto when you use it. So enhance your financial life with Nexo, who ensures all credit lines are over collateralized with insurance on all custodial assets. Nexo, the right place for your crypto. So click the link in the show notes to join over 5 million users who are getting the most out of their crypto. Well, as we move from kind of the uh, the technical layer, I want to talk about uh, maybe a bit more of the social layer and mm-hmm. um, you know, moving from engineering to uh, some of the softer sciences like like philosophy and maybe uh, political science here. And I, I think one question that um, we're left with Ethereum is, okay, what is this thing that we have built so far? Uh, there is this notion, I know you're familiar with it, um, of the network stake, the network state rather uh and this mm. is a concept most recently put forward by um balaji uh mm-hmm. he was on the podcast as well recently and um we asked balaji who's been a long time in in crypto of course from the very beginnings uh do you think that 
the the network state is kind of the the main thing that the crypto mm. project is focused on and his answer was yes absolutely that's what we are doing money mm. is just a subset of the network state i'm curious your perspective on this vitalik and i know you have thoughts but let's talk about um ethereum uh mm -hmm. first do mm -hmm. you think ethereum is an example of a Bellagian network state or a network state of, you know, some, some other uh, conceptual framework? I would say no. Um, and uh, I mean, I would like, I think uh, Ethereum has a uh, very important role to play in network states, but I would say uh, Ethereum is like a bit of a uh, higher layer thing. And uh, the reason why I would say that is that at this point in the uh, Ethereum community has grown very, very big, very diverse, very pluralist in a lot of ways. And one of the things that that means that it uh, sacrifices is definitely an assumption of uh, alignment on a lot of like issues that people really care about, especially on non crypto related topics, right? Like, I think uh, if you look at, you know, even Bitcoin 10, 10 years ago and or like even ethereum eight years ago and you asked like uh, a, a question of uh like what do you think the right federal minimum wage is or like what's your view on how healthcare should be provided or you know what's uh, your perspective on immigration or um you know who's right in some like ge geopolitical situation you know like 10 years ago you would have gotten a lot more alignment and i think these days uh, you're going to get less alignment on uh, those kinds of issues and i think that's uh, an inevitable part of the uh, ecosystem growing and it's also a healthy thing right like a uh, glenn uh, loves to use the phrase like facilitating cooperation across difference and uh, to me, facilitating cooperation across uh, difference is definitely uh, part of uh, what both um, you know, blockchains and a lot of the uh, equipment on uh, blockchains is uh, going to be about. Um, one uh, probably just a very concrete example, just to kind of uh, dive like very briefly into the weeds before we dive back out of uh, what I'm talking about is the whole ENS Brantley situation, right? Like that was uh, something where people within the ethereum ecosystem who are passionate ethereans and who have dot eth names you know they did have a very uh, different perspectives on that situation that they uh, care deeply about and i think it's a testament to if the ethereum ecosystem and even to ens itself that uh, we were able to navigate that and even navigate like pretty close to a 50 50 split i think in the uh, ens dow's decision of like whether or not uh, brantley should be fired right uh without uh that really turning into like a big schism that bre that breaks Ethereum um, all together. Um, but and to refresh people with with mm -hmm. the Brantley situation, Brantley had some uh, controversial comments. Uh, mm -hmm. What was it at the time that uh, you know a subset of the Ethereum community disagreed vehemently with? Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, any other any other light on that for for folks that weren't familiar with the current event as it happened in Ethereum world? Yeah, I mean, like he basically has kind of traditional uh, religious uh, views on uh, topics like, uh, you know, homosexuality and, uh, and like th those kinds of topics that are like, I mean, d definitely extremely out of step with, uh, you know, especially people who have a more left -lean uh, left leaning ethos. Um, and what but... was the what was the outcome? So the outcome was that there were a lot of calls to uh, basically fire Brantley or, you know, cancel him uh, for various uh, meanings of that term. And I think he did end up getting pushed out of True Names LTD, the company, but there was a vote to try to push him out of the ENS DAO. And I think that vote ended up failing. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, Brantley is part of Ethereum land and there are people in some uh, kind of sub islands of Ethereum who uh, do not really interact with him or wants to interact with him. And then there are some people who do, right? And uh, so he, so he did, uh, he did, um, you're, you're right in that he did not get kicked out of the DAO or did he did not lose a lot of his like delegation, but he did kind of be removed socially. He had much less presence on Twitter. Uh, mm -hmm. People listened to him a lot less. Mm -hmm. uh, and so while the formal DAO did not remove his power, he did like kind of socially take a few, get like knock down a few rungs, if you will. Mm -hmm. So there was some sort of like hybrid outcome to this. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, the, yeah, the, the crypto space, I think, has, uh, you know, obviously, yeah, 
continues to intersect with uh, geopolitics more and more. The other big example of that it was um, obviously the whole uh, Ukraine uh, situation uh, this year. And uh, there, I think, uh, and I'm like, I personally am not aware of like Ethereum community. I actually, no, maybe, yeah, maybe with, within the Aragon team, which is uh, Russian, um, there's uh, definitely, yeah, more people who have like takes that uh, vehemently yeah, disagree with uh, my position. And I mean, I guess uh, your, your position on that issue. Um, but, uh, and there has been some uh, even uh, Twitter drama on that. Uh, but you know, more and more of these uh, do crop up and more and more of these will crop up. But I guess my view there is that, uh, you know, like I have uh, views on each one of these issues and we have uh, views on each one of these issues. And I don't think that like our role as participants in the Ethereum ecosystem should uh, cause us to shy away from expressing our views on uh, the, uh, on some of those topics because I um, you know those topics are very important. I think some of what you're saying, Vitalik, is that Ethereum is is almost like uh, too credibly neutral to become a Blagian network state. Like it doesn't have right. strong enough opinions. It's kind of like asking mm -hmm. the internet to become a network mm -hmm. state. Well, what is the internet? It's yeah. a whole bunch of mm -hmm. tribes coming together to to interact. So. But 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 maybe so if, if Ethereum itself is not a, a, a network state and can't become one, it doesn't have a, a social fabric that has enough um, you know, coherence, I suppose, around a particular set of values, other mm. than being decentralized and being credibly neutral itself, uh, then is Ethereum a substrate for mm. spawning other network states on top of? I think absolutely, um, and um, I think uh, Ethereum, like it, it, absolutely is still a uh, both a substrate and a home for a lot of uh, different sub communities that do have these uh, much more uh, detailed and uh, opinionated visions of uh, the uh, kind of uh, world that they want to see. And like I do think that Ethereum, to some extent, does sort of structurally have uh, some opinions in the sense of like. If you're a person that really does believe in the World Economic Forum vision of a cashless society, then like there's just much less for you that Ethereum can offer, right? So I do think that you know there is some extent to which Ethereum as a thing has uh, values baked into it, and there are values that are shared by like mu that are much more shared by the yeah, Ethereum community than by the yeah, world as a whole, right? Um, but uh, the I think the the right level to try to make some of these more opinionated visions come to life is by yeah, things like sub communities that are close to Ethereum and that are even proud of their alignments with Ethereum, but they do sort of recognize their distinction from Ethereum itself, and this, so that do sort of both give permission to people for for people to still be Ethereans, but at the same time not not want not liking uh, their vision. And, and uh, also by doing so, uh, kind of give themselves the freedom to like really have these like, like stronger moral commitments uh, without, um, you know, fear of kind of offending people by uh, speaking for e Ethereum as a whole, right? So like I would love to see um, multiple Ethereum uh, network states. Um, I would, uh, I, I think... Uh, Within the network state concept, like there is a lot of room for the, uh, um, like some kind of concept of uh, kind of coordinating layers between uh, network states in general, right? Like I, I do think that uh, once there are multiple network states, there are going to have some, co they are going to have some common interests uh, that just have to do with uh, the fact that the, the, that they're all network states. Um, I think. Uh, there might even be value in co-locating uh, some some of them uh, beside each other, for example, um, so that you know they can interact with each other, but without literally being part of the exact same turf and uh, you know the sort of the high levels of alignment that come out of something like that. Um, and I think Ethereum is and can be part of the yeah, alignment layer, but there is probably also room for other kinds of alignment layers between different uh, network states as well. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, it it it'll be interesting. I think um, you know we'll see how that whole uh, vision is uh, going to evolve. I mean, I think uh, just basically saying like saying that uh, network states are something that should be free to be more opinionated is uh, something that's uh, probably even going to just create a better world because we'll get more like, more interesting uh, visions that uh, will try to use the concepts to be able to do more.
when we when we talk about the World Economic Forum and Ethereum, we're comparing like the value systems of these two like poles, right? Uh, but I, I think it's fair to say that the World Economic Forum is very like opinionated and it's very like political. And Ethereum is designed to be this credibly neutral platform. And I think perhaps it's a fair take to say that the reason why we can't really find much room on Ethereum for the World Economic Forum is due to that difference, right? Like we can't really find a way to include the WEF's values on our our credibly neutral social settlement layer. There's just like not room for them to, to appear. And so when we talk about other network states or other political systems that do find good ways to inhabit space on Ethereum, and maybe there's more than one, maybe there's a number of them, th that's that's true. They are, are able to do that because they are more aligned with the value, values found in Ethereum, or they fit inside of it a little bit better. And so Ethereum as a system of supporting many, many network states does come to actually like proliferate its values upon the world by supporting many, many other network states that fit on top of Ethereum, that fit well inside of Ethereum's structure. And so Ethereum kind of becomes like the meta structure that allows for many, many network states to proliferate. And I think what you were saying with like uh, co-locating network states, maybe both in physical territory, but also two, two network states that are just like very similar are also going to be able to cooperate with each other, work well together and grow stronger because of that cooperation. And so I'm, I'm wondering if like, where you, if you see this kind of like trajectory for things and network states being built on Ethereum, where if there were, if we're going to get a proliferation of many, many network states, some of them are going to be able to fit better than others. And the ones mm -hmm. that fit better than others are able to adapt with each other better than others. And then this is kind of the snowball that carries us into this Bellagian network state future that I think he is very, very hopeful for. Is that mm -hmm. a fair uh, take for the future? I'd say so. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's definitely true that uh, some ideologies fit better into both uh, Ether uh, Ethereum and the yeah, network state world uh, than uh, others. I mean, the World Economic Forum is an interesting case, right? Because like, there is the World Economic Forum as an actual thing. And then there's the World Economic Forum as like, the thing that Twitter trolls mythologize it into. And right. I, yeah, I mean, I I get I always get the feeling that uh, like I I haven't been to the the forum myself but you know I get yeah, talks to like people who have uh, participated in it and like uh, and um, you know there are very diverse people and there's definitely people that like just wants to create infrastructure for schools in developing countries um but so you know it is a forum and ultimately a forum like internet forums are like places where discussion happens, but at the same time, forums like the yeah, our Bitcoin forum, yeah, you know, they do tend to like uh, skew toward particular ideologies as well. So we always, you know, there's there's always a balance uh, bet between those uh, two tendencies, and uh, I mean, I think there's definitely yeah, the some aspect like the. The concept of globalism, right? Like that, that that's an interesting one. Like, uh, I don't know if you saw, there was that uh, Twitter poll I made where I basically asked people how they uh, identify me. And one of the questions was, am I a globalist and do you like globalism? <laughs> and uh, there were people who said they like globalism and I'm a globalist. And there's people who say they don't like globalism and I'm not a globalist. Hmm. And this is because there's like actually two different meanings of the term globalism. Like one is this sort of, uh, you know, cosmopolitan, and vibe of like someone has the same moral value of whether they're from the United States or Canada or Uganda and uh, you know I'm I'm going to be open to treating any of those people as my brother um, and then there is globalism as in one world government and uh, like I'm obviously a fan of the first and not a fan of the second and I think a lot of people are fans of the first and not fans of the yeah, second but they yeah, still um, like they just disagree on the semantic question of uh, which one of those two the world the word globalist uh, belongs to, and you know even within the world the World Economic Forum, I think there's uh, definitely people who are very ideologically inclined toward the second, but then there's uh, I think also people who are much more inclined uh, toward the first and don't care about the second, and I think 
as a yeah, a kind of global um you know you could call it sort of alternative liberal you know with uh you using the word liberal liberal in the lowercase uh, sense um movement uh there's an opportunity to try to like really split those two and to like basically show people that like some notion of a uh, global brotherhood you know it doesn't actually require global political centralization but uh yeah uh, this is I, I think these are all fascinating things and like obviously um why why even let's so the social science side of of this crypto movement is maybe in some ways more interesting than the the technology side but you know you're talking about the semantics of words words like uh, globalism and how that's changed i also think the s semantics uh behind words in crypto have changed so um take the word dao that mm. used to mean something different than what it means today. And I would even say uh, a year ago, it meant something different than it does today. Uh, you wrote a post, uh, which I uh, read yesterday, I was, I was quite fascinated with. And the title of that post was, DAOs are not corporations. And I think you were responding to a, a new kind of um, concept, or I guess, um, thing that's been in vogue recently, which is the idea that all DAOs that we have on Ethereum and other crypto networks um, should get their shit together a bit more, should get a bit more organized, should nail down a structure, uh, and should start to resemble more corporate governance. I think you push back on that claim, and you think that some DAOs maybe are fit for corporate governance, but others are should be more public, should be more inspired by the political scientists uh, and the political science uh, that we have. Um, and, and maybe that's the lens of Ethereum. We'll, we'll start there, but back to what is this thing called Ethereum. Is Ethereum a DAO? And like, what actually are DAOs? Should they be managed corporately? Or are there new governance systems that we're unlocking here? Mm. It's a good question. Um, I mean, I think we haven't really even fully defined the term DAO as uh, some of the examples in that post uh, go into, right? Like, uh, there's this sort of vague notion among a lot of people that a DAO still should be this kind of logically centralized singleton where um, money goes into one place and there's a global vote on every funding decision. And that's clearly just a bad model. And it's uh, a model that probably doesn't even give people what they want out of DAOs. And then there's this alternative architecture that's uh, are kind of inspired by uh, what Ukraine DAO is uh, doing, where you have the core that makes uh, these uh, decisions, but then you have pods and pods have uh, a much higher level of autonomy and that seems like something that actually like gives people more of what they want out of uh, decentralization so and like obviously ukraine dao was not the only one like there was also vita dao uh, which was uh doing uh life extension research there's uh all of the various uh, DAOs that are trying to like r run uh long-term pieces of infrastructure so uh you know reflexer for rye maker for a maker dao uh Kleros, uh, then optimism retro funding and all of these things uh, so i hope that we're going to learn a lot from these examples i hope that a couple of years from now we're going to have like some much better models of uh, what a good DAO looks like and uh you know, once we once we you know, learn from them, then you know, would the yeah, Ethereum Foundation be able to become a DAO based on that kind of model? You know, we'll see. Um, I guess that 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 was one of those things that's also been a yeah, dream from uh, close to the beginning. Um, and then, you know, optimism, uh, obviously, yeah, very uh, DAO controlled. Like, what other DAOs we're going to see within the Ethereum ecosystem? I mean, we'll see. It'll be interesting. Why 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 don't DAOs just all operate with a corporate? governance structure. I mean, there is the argument, Vitalik, that we have baked out corporate governance over the last you know, 200 years. Uh, we've made it pretty efficient. There's a, a CEO, there's an executive team, there's a board of advisors. There are these governors that, that keep them in check. These are called shareholders. And it works pretty well. Like um, all of the, the products that we experience in our, in our modern world were brought to you by corporation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, somebody on the S&P 500 went and created this. And so these these joint stock ownership companies with the corporate structure works pretty well. Isn't a DAO just trying to mirror that? Or is there something different here? That's a good question. Um, I think uh, there's two arguments that I have against uh, that line of thinking, right? 
Well, one of those, well, I mean, actually three arguments, right, in, in the post. Like one of them is that some things require censorship resistance and uh, corporations are not good at censorship resistance. Another one is that corporations are good at building products, but they're less good at providing infrastructure, right? So like, for example, social media companies have uh, completely failed at uh, pr satisfying uh, people's uh, desire for some notion that like the the uh, content decisions that they're making are fair right and that and that's the sort of thing that DAOs might actually be better at than uh, traditional corp forms of uh, corporate governance and then a yeah, third one is this uh, the fact that like well actually corporations are designed around the yeah, idea that they're second order organizations and they can appeal to uh, first order courts uh, when uh, something goes wrong right like uh, the um, like you can 51% attack a uh, company right and uh, like potentially 51% of the shareholders could try to vote to uh, kick out the other 49% but that is explicitly illegal and the uh, mechanism that enforces that is itself a uh, uh, you know, the, ultimately the yeah, government that uh, enforces shareholder laws, right? Uh, and so if we're going to build a DAO, then, then the DAO has to include all, all of that functionality that's normally provided by nation states by itself. And, uh, you know, corporate governance is not good at doing that, but political science, so like that's exactly the sort of stuff that it studies. Yeah, that's uh, it's definitely fascinating to see how that evolves. Um, may, maybe let's switch back to you, Ethereum for a minute and and kind of the the end game. I, I guess if if you know using as simple words as possible, Vitalik, how would you describe Ethereum's end state? Like at the end of this long roadmap, the theme of this episode I think has been what's next. At the end of all of these things that we've talked about so far, of what's next, what does Ethereum look like and what does it deliver for the world? Mm. I think, well, Ethereum's uh, ethos uh, from the beginning, right, I think has been to insist on uh, a few particular values, but otherwise not have its own picture of like what specific things it uh, brings to the world, but uh, leave that up to the yeah, ecosystem and uh, lots of uh, different groups to uh, create their own vision. Um, and I think uh, just having a well-functioning global cryptocurrency is uh, a huge amount of value by itself. Like it's uh, especially valuable to uh, people outside of uh, the, the first world. Uh, and you know, in places like Latin America, Africa, uh, Eastern Europe, and uh, other uh, you know Central Asia and other places that have a yeah, harder time with the existing financial system, um, Ethereum being the yeah, substrate for DAOs that and like uh, mechanisms that do other things. Uh, so identity is uh, one of the biggest examples. Like, can we create some kind of more decentralized model of identity and uh, really yeah, you know start with uh, what some of the tools that the Ethereum ecosystem has already, whether it's uh, you know accounts and uh, hopefully soon social recovery wallets and ENS and like things like Popes and like try to really uh, optimize that and uh, do what we can to build it into something that's like really good at providing what people want out of an uh, identity system. Um, like what would it even? Uh, being a base layer for DAOs in general, like, uh, I mean, network states are, I mean, we yeah, just talked about those for 10 or 15 minutes, but like, what would it actually mean for Ethereum to be a base layer for things like that? Um, things like proof of humanity um, would would be, yeah, would have uh, always been uh, one of my favorite uh, applications. Um, other kinds of uh, censorship uh, resistant applications, um, other kinds of like credibly neutral and decentralized applications like uh you know, could we actually do the whole blockchain-based uh, social media thing and uh, try to create social media platforms that are like more credibly neutral and fair in some way? Uh, so, well, like, I don't think there is one vision for what Ethereum could do. I think there's uh, many different visions. And I think uh, 
once Ethereum manages to solve its uh, scaling problems, it's going to be in a yeah, much better place to uh, help uh, be the substrate that allows all of those missions to happen. Arbitrum 1 is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum 1, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum 1 and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. The Brave Wallet is your secure multi-chain on-ramp into Web3, and it's built directly into the Brave privacy browser. Gone are the days of managing multiple wallet extensions that put you at risk of phishing, spoofs, and tracking. With the Brave wallet, you can securely manage your crypto assets across more than 100 different chains, including Ethereum, Layer 2s, Solana, and more, all without downloading risky extensions. The Brave wallet is easy to set up and removes the headache of jumping between wallets and extensions. It's lightweight, but packed with great features like built-in token swaps, buying and holding NFTs with a gallery view, and support for hardware wallets. But also much more than that, because Brave is shipping new features every single month with a mission to make Web3 easier to navigate for its over 55 million users. Wallet extensions are a thing of the past. So get started with Brave's Web3 Ready browser today and experience a decentralized web seamlessly without all the clutter. You can download the browser at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. The Layer 2 era is upon us. Ethereum's Layer 2 ecosystem is growing every day, and we need Layer 2 bridges to be fast and efficient in order to live a Layer 2 life. Across is the fastest, cheapest, and most secure cross-chain bridge. With Across, you don't have to worry about high fees or long wait times. Assets are bridged and available for use almost instantaneously. Across's bridges are powered by UMA's optimistic oracle to securely transfer tokens between Layer 2s and Ethereum. Across is critical ecosystem infrastructure, and Across V2 has just launched. Their new version focuses on higher capital efficiency, layer two to layer two transfers, and a brand new chain with Polygon, all while prioritizing high security and low fees. You can be a part of Across's story by joining their Discord and using Across for all of your layer two transferring needs. So go to across.to to quickly and securely bridge your assets between Ethereum, Optimism, Polygon, Arbitrum, or Boba networks. I love that part of the answer to the question of what's next for Ethereum is like question mark. We don't actually know it's up, it's up what's on you. the other side. It's like a two zero adventure. Um, Vitalik, mm -hmm. before we uh, close this out, finally, uh, Danny Ryan came on the podcast earlier this week, and uh, he told us that you had some thoughts on AI, artificial intelligence, that is. Um, Vitalik, do you have any hot takes on AI? Like, are you worried about... Since we're on the topic of what's yeah. next. <laughs> mm. Are you worried about AI in society? Is like, are AIs an existential threat to humanity? Do you see any intersection with crypto? Give us any hot takes. Yeah, well, the what I will really want to know actually out of this is like AIs are not going to have bank accounts, but AIs can totally manage private keys. Mm -hmm. And so, like, what intersection does this? Did we look just like? create a substrate for AIs to gain control over the human race, yeah. and it's over now? Yeah. So when I was uh, visiting the Bay Area, like as uh, part of my uh, trip to SBC, I uh, also visited and uh, talked to a bunch of various AI people, like people from Anthropic and OpenAI and uh, some of the uh, big um, you know, AI firms and just general AI boosters in the space. And I was surprised by the fast timelines that a lot of them have, right? Like uh, going in, I think my timelines were more that, you know, we're going to get like the something like the singularity um, by, yeah, you know, sometime around 2075. And when I gave this a number to people, they're like, oh, wow, you're crazy. How can you possibly think AI is going to be that slow? And wow, like, a lot of them are literally expecting human level AI uh, before the end of this decade. And, um, you know, the singularity, yeah, we'll take it after that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, th these are obviously inside views, and my yeah, default instinct is to be yeah, skeptical. But, uh, m you know, like, I think it's important to ask the question of, uh, like, well, what if they're right? And, uh, 
you know, what if over the next a decade or two, AI basically ends up uh, eating the world? And then the question that we have to think about is like, what is the role that crypto has to play in an uh, AI dominated world, right? Like, uh, you know, are structures that uh, kind of insist on the yeah, idea that like humans are the yeah, only kind of significant actor in the space so, like are those going to survive a yeah, an ai transition like what would uh, an ai even look like would uh, could crypto be a yeah, part of uh, like somehow democratically governing the yeah, ais that come out would uh, cr crypto be a yeah, something that could help um you know coordinate like some alternative uh, you know ai uh, uh projects so that the whole ai uh, transition doesn't lead to just massive centralization in uh, one or two companies i mean i don't know uh, but uh, i think it's uh, important for anyone to be yeah thinking about the future of uh, crypto as a space to also to be yeah like also have the question in mind of uh in how does AI play into this and like what would a yeah, merger of uh well not a mer no merger but like what would the interplay between uh, crypto and AI look like I don't yet perfectly know the answer to this question but I just think it's uh, a really important question that we need to be yeah, very serious about thinking about do you have any thoughts on like um AI ethics and making sure that we embed you know, human-oriented ethics into AIs mm -hmm. very early so that we don't get an advanced general intelligence that kind of runs away from us. I mean, Nick Bolstrom has talked about yeah. this in his books, Elon Musk and, mm -hmm. and others, wondering if you've looked at that angle of things. It's a very good question. Um, so actually, the yeah, people in the Bay Area that have uh, fast timelines, they're also more optimistic about AI safety and, and AI alignment than they have been before. Um, the way to explain like the, the reason why is because a lot of the like very doom and gloomy uh, AI alignment theory, like it basically implicitly assumed that AIs would be grown by base by essentially playing real time strategy games against each other, right? Like if you think of how something like Alpha Zero was grown, right? It just uh, you know it's able to learn to play a game by uh, playing against itself uh, billions of times, and uh, then it just becomes really good at Go, and you just like f take that model and you translate it to optimizing it, manipulating the natural world as a whole. And with that kind of a uh, uh, growth uh, path, like it's easy to see why that AI would be totally um, just un uh, unaware of uh, and not able to be aligned with human values, right? Because uh, the AI uh, grew and uh, developed its patterns of thinking without any interaction with humans. The AI's path to be to becoming intelligent was not would not even be the same path that humans took. Where um, you know there's this uh, complicated uh, interplay of uh, cooperation and uh, competition, and there's even a big argument to be made that human intelligence basically evolved as a result of uh, humans having to play political games against each other, right? And uh, AIs would just be yeah, in a completely different concept, and so or or they would be born and raised in a completely different way, right? And so maybe the whole, like, would the AI just turn the universe into paper clips to be able to calculate a little faster thing here is like a really excellent question to ask. But the AIs that we're seeing today, they're AIs that are grown by basically learning patterns of human behavior and uh, at, at basically yeah, at repeatedly attempting to pattern match the situation that they're in to the human behavior that's been uh, repeated the greatest number of times in a context that's similar to that pattern. And so... The AIs that emerge out of that kind of uh, learning process just are going to be AIs that are sort of more naturally human uh, by default. It also means that we're going to have slower takeoff because uh, like, there is a natural divide between being able to get to human level intelligence and surpassing it uh, because uh, human level intelligence... Uh, like you can get to human level intelligence if you're just a really good pattern matching engine that learns from all the humans. But uh, moving beyond human level intelligence requires you to like actually uh, come up with things yourself. Uh, so it's still like a step. It's still a step higher, basically, right? Uh, so we have more time. The yeah, AIs are more likely to be human-like. Uh, we're more likely to see multiple AIs instead of one single AI dominating everything. Uh, so all of those things paint a yeah, more optimistic picture. And also, there, 
the work that's been happening in AI alignment now, like it's less theoretical and it's more practical. Like it's trying to say, how do we take the AIs that we're building today? And uh, how do we try to make them be as aligned as possible? And that's a path that seems to be like slowly starting to make more headway. Uh, so I'm, uh, I mean, obviously we still have very big problems. Um, I think, uh, very big problems from the yeah, risk of um, you know the AIs that take over being unaligned. And I would say also a yeah, political centralization risk from like bad versions of AI alignment theory being used to justify an idea that AI risk means that AIs have to be um, you know in a lab where only a couple of uh, large corporations run by sort of self-appointed ethical high priests uh, should be the only ones that have ac uh, that, that have um, access to the capabilities and uh, you know base if people who does who build the yeah, most powerful AIs end up having uh, that kind of mindset then like what would that mean for the political structure of the world? That's kind of like a, a secondary uh, AI risk that I think is uh, also worth thinking about, especially in the near term, right? Because like the AIs that we have today, those are they're more like more than a decade away from like paper clip uh, paper clipping risk. But uh, you know, if we enter a world where like the U.S. and uh, Chinese governments can make deep fakes, but no one else can, then uh, like in some ways, that's worse than a world where where everyone can make deep fakes because it just you know gives it just sort of un you know unbalances the yeah, balance of power toward two particular organizations. So I know I think uh, this like that stuff is also uh, stuff that's uh, probably worth uh, thinking about, and it's definitely been more on my mind than uh, it has been six months ago. But uh, you know we'll see. That's interesting. Yeah, and I, I'm wondering mm. if you um you vibe at all with uh with Peter Thiel's take where AI is kind of a centralizing technology, whereas whereas crypto is a technology of decentralization and almost like a defense, a, a bulwark against the centralizing mm. uh, functions of AI. Does anything in that idea resonate with you? I mean, that's an idea that I've repeated myself multiple times, right? I think uh, the uh, question is like, how do we take that from sort of the world of theory and the world of like abstractly thinking about AI and crypto as sort of ideologies for the world and into the yeah, question of like, well, what concretely can crypto do to try to mitigate the chance that uh, AI leads to centralizing everything? Which is faster or further along in its roadmap, Ethereum or generalized AI? <sighs> <laughs> That's a good question. It depends on how far you like how far you want to go. I do still expect that uh, we are going to get Ethereum f like fully finishing its vision before we'll get to to a human level AI. But like even close to human level AI, like that's going to start to make our world look very different. This is a uh, fantastic uh, bear market content for us on the AI side of things. <laughs> um, I think actually we want to explore this a bit further. Uh, Vitalik. Ryan's taking notes. Yeah, taking notes. <laughs> I, I'm curious from your perspective: is there anyone in the AI field that uh, we should be talking to on Bankless as we're looking at this? Hmm. I will. I will think about this, and um, if I find names, I will send them to you. Fantastic. Beautiful. Vitalik, mm -hmm. it has been a pleasure mm -hmm. talking to you about what is next for Ethereum. We didn't say it at the outset, but uh, congratulations to you, Thank to you. us, to the entire Ethereum community for this major milestone and uh, getting to this point. Congratulations to you too. It's uh, all been a great journey. Mm -hmm. Bankless Nation, we've got some action items for you. Lots in the show notes today. Uh, number one is Proof of Stake, which is the, the book that Vitalik uh, has come out with. And this is, I think, Vitalik, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of your blog posts only in book mm -hmm. form, which makes it more accessible for, for, um, for people. Is that correct? Yes. Also, uh, some links to the posts that we talked about today, the paths to single slot finality. DAOs are not... Uh, corporations on Vitalik's website. And what does Vitalik think about network states? We'll also include a link to the MEV Boost website where you can see all of the builders and relayers in production. As always, got to end with risks and disclaimers. Crypto is risky. Luna is risky. Uh, <laughs> Luna is extremely risky. But to be honest, Ethereum is risky too. You could lose what you put in, but we're headed west. This is the frontier. Um, this 
technically it's uh, the London Hard Fork, but it's still the frontier. <laughs> it's uh, not for everyone, but uh, we're glad you're with us on the bank bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.